I'm delighted to say I'm joined by the MC, the referee, spotter and statistician Richard Ashdown. Thanks very much for the time, Richard. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good, Alex. Good to speak to you. Now, we're gradually coming out of this lockdown, but it's been three or four months with the darts calendar on hold. We may not see you every week on the screen, but there's really a weekend. You're not somewhere around the world. What's the break been like for you? Oh, well, it's been a shock to the system, to be honest. I mean, I can't remember. You know, I was trying to count back through the calendar when I had a period of even, you know, two weekends in a row at home. I mean, it's been, for everybody, I think, involved in the sport, it, it has been a real shock to the system, <laughs> just not travelling. Has there been maybe one event or one gig in particular that you were most looking forward to that got cancelled? I think you were due to do the World Series, weren't you, in Copenhagen and New York? Yeah, I mean, the World Series is always an absolute delight to work on, not just because of the people involved, but because of the, the travel. The actual location element is so attractive. So going to New York, um, which is one of my favourite places anyway, to do darts, <laughs> that's going to sting a bit for, for everybody, whether it was a player an official or somebody where I was going to be doing the spotting. Um, yeah, that, that, was a, that was a tough one. But for me, I think the routine that I'm missing the most is the European tour. That, that forms a big part of my work with the spotting, and I really miss that, just the, the regular travels uh, to Germany and elsewhere with the, the Dutch crew that I work with. I, I'm missing that for sure. We have, of course, seen you on our screens, though, with the Remote Darts League over the last couple of months. How did you find out about it at first, and what was your initial reaction when you got asked to present the whole thing? Yeah, it's an interesting one. I, when um, the PDC were the first to do a few lots of groups from home, weren't they? The first reaction I had was just thinking of the players, that it's a chance to keep them competitive, and I think that's been the, the the rewarding thing, Modus have done a great job with it, the PDC have, and when the Remote Darts League contacted me, I just thought it was a great opportunity for everybody to, to stay fresh and stay competitive. And that was what came out of it for me. I think some players are going to come out of this with the amount of darts. Cause it's not the same, of course it's not the same, and all the players are saying that. But there's a big difference between practising on your own at home or having some edge, you know, the pressure to hit a double and hit the big scores against someone else. So I could definitely see that with the Remote Darts League. It's very competitive overall, and I think uh, a lot of players will benefit from the experience. Definitely, and we had Richard Veenstra on our last show, the winner of the second Remote Darts League, which uh -huh. saw an expanded field to 16, including the, the four ladies as well. How do you feel the Remote Darts League's first two stages have gone overall? Yeah, well, it's been a different format. I, I quite like the fact that it was one event. I mean, there's a lot of the others were running in groups on the day. I, I quite liked the prolonged, drawn-out part of it. Some didn't, but I liked that we built a story. So the first one was over 10 days with the 10 players. The second one was huge, of course, with 16 players over 21 days. And like, I guess, stage and floor matches, there were some players that took to it straight away and others that didn't. The like, I mean, James Richardson, across the two remote darts leagues, was just outstanding. He, he didn't play well on finals night of the second one. But he was remarkable across, the, across the, the 30 days of the two combined. He was absolutely superb. But yeah, Richard looked as cool as ever, didn't he? He's a laid-back character anyway. Mr. Venstra really looked the part. It's been a, a few weeks, of course, since we saw the end of the, the second one. Can you give us any insight into the future plans for Remote Darts League? Will we see a third one, or is there any news on the horizon for that? There is no news, but I'm sorry to say I'm not involved in any kind of organising of the Remote Darts League. I am the hired help, you know. I'm there as a host and a referee, but I'm not involved in organising it. And I'd love it if they could do it again, but I've not heard a thing. Though. Fair enough. And last time we had you on the show, I mentioned it before we started recording, 2018, that just before Lakeside, the start of that year, it turned out to be <laughs> your penultimate Lakeside. You did, of course, 2019, which ended up being the, the last one there anyway. And we've had a, a question come in from one of our listeners, Owen Finney, said, what was the most memorable walk-on that you emceed at Lakeside? Oh, so I did six years there. I mean, it, I, I tell, the first thing that came to mind when you said that, there were two or three walk-ons that I did actually off-air for the audience, and they stick in my mind, and I almost wish there was footage. For example, Martin Adams didn't qualify for Lakeside 2019, so he played in 25 in a row, and we made a presentation for him on semi-finals day. That walk-on, I think, was, the, and he says it himself, was the most incredible entrance I think he's ever made in that venue and we didn't see it on screen I, I did the same with Bobby George giving him the walk on when he was working for the BBC 
and those moments weren't on air, but of course, within the tournament itself, it, it, it's the crowd that make the walk-ons, uh, and and some of the finals, especially. I mean, I remember the, I think it's 2017, isn't it? Danny Nopper playing Glenn Durrant in the final. I was just having that feeling when I started speaking on finals day that I literally could not hear myself speak, and the, that wall of atmosphere because it's such a small venue and the ceiling is low that it can be louder in that room than at a Premier League venue because it's so compact. So when you're stood on stage, you're so close to the audience, they can, they can really shake you. Uh, so the adrenaline for things like that. I mean, I remember Lisa Ashton and Anastasia de Bromislova, their final. The atmosphere is just terrific in that venue. So every walk-on's a pleasure, I must say, but when you bring on legends like uh, Tony O'Shea, such famous names in that venue, the way the crowd respond to them, uh, that makes it absolutely brilliant. Special memories for sure. And it was July last oh, yeah. year, almost uh, a year ago now, that you announced your resignation as the MC and head referee of the BDO. 26 years ago, you mentioned you, you first went to Lakeside 1994 and you were a spotter since 2002. How hard of a decision was that to make to resign there? Oh, the toughest in my professional career, without a doubt, because my heart is in it so much. But I think that's the key point, that all of a sudden my heart wasn't in it. And, and I think that was the key thing to me making the decision. The way that the BDO was being managed, I, I could feel a lot of discord between the commercial element and the, the, the board of directors. It just didn't feel right for me for the future. Now, hindsight's a lovely thing, but when we go a year on after me leaving, I think I did the right thing because what has happened, I had a feeling would happen. And um, I, I, I made the right choice to, to walk away when I did. Yeah, and you say it was a hard decision to make and you mentioned there you look at what the, the BDO is at the moment. Is it hard to see what's happening with the BDO at the moment with what looks like it could be the last World Masters and the last World Championship we might have already seen them? Yeah, very. It's heartbreaking. I mean, whether it, it's not about political allegiance. This is where the arts for me began. I, I played counter use with the BDO. I, As you've mentioned, I, I followed the World Championship from 1994. Uh, and to see what's happened to it is never mind disturbing from a business point of view or from my own job. I'm not talking about it from my profession. I'm talking about it as a darts fan. The World Masters and the World Championship are an integral part of the sport we know. And to see what's happened is really disappointing. Hopefully, it's not the end as far as the non-PDC side, that there are other elements and ways that things can regenerate. But for the BDO, it seems that the race is run. And of course, you still kept your roles with the England Darts Organisation, the, the WDF as well. And last year, you emceed the, the World Cup, the WDF World Cup, which was held in Romania. Just how special an event is that to be a part of with so many countries coming together? It's um, always been an absolute pleasure to work on the WDF events. I've actually done that for twice as long as I worked with the BDO. I think 12 years now I've done the WDF Cups. But and I mean this in a positive way, even though it's a negative commercially. It, it feels like a festival when you're there, but of course it's private because it's not really seen by the masses, is it? it mm -hmm. it's, it's fantastic to be at the venue and experience it. There were 53 countries in Romania last autumn. That, 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 there's nothing like it. I mean, there's no darts event where you get to that. Probably nothing in life, Alex, where you're in a room with 50-plus nations <laughs> at the same time having fun, watching competitive darts, and the camaraderie and the, and the whole atmosphere around it can't be beat. But the WDF, I was quite vocal with them, to be honest. They, they do a terrific job in that sense, but I felt they were invisible in the wider world. I, I was the one that took it to the WF and said, look, you're the governing body. You have been for over 40 years. It's time to step up and take hold of things with what's going on in the BDO. And to their absolute credit, they've done just that. And, and the work since the World Cup to try and steady the ship for amateur darts has been going great guns i mean we can't release anything yet publicly but we're on the brink of launching um the two major tournaments that should be run by the bdo so that's the positive that's great news and i wanted to get on to talk about your work with the wdf of course you're doing the yeah. mc and but you've also got the role of the chief development officer as well can you tell us a little bit about what that involves yeah i mean when i came in and spoke to the members the countries the whole point was what i've just said that it's time for there to be a circuit that's done by the governing body themselves, not assigned to anybody else. Yes, of course, all of the nations run their ranking events, but the top of the pyramid has to be the World Arts Federation. 
And for many, many years, it was the BDO. And the WF sanctioned the BDO to run that, and that was fair enough. But now, there should be a system that's for all countries and a path for all of our member nations. And what's important, I think more than anything now, is security for the players, because there's so much uncertainty that's been created by what's happened with the BDO. There's no trust anymore. So I think the first objective for the WDF is to secure a World Championship and a World Masters type event that the players are used to, and just so they have faith in a system that gets them there again, without worry or ifs and buts, but just knowing what's at the end of the <laughs> what's at the end of the yellow brick road. That's the important thing. <laughs> Definitely, and it was the start of this year, and you mentioned it a moment ago. The WDF making some noise about holding their own major events, a, a World Masters, mm-hmm. a, a World Championship, and of course you mentioned there that there's some great news on the horizon you can't quite go into too much detail but of course the the pandemic has obviously hampered everyone with with making plans but what can you tell us about it uh, the future events is there venues is there dates is there anything that you can tell us about those events yeah the thing the problem is because it, I, I didn't actually want to make any kind of reference or excuse regarding the pandemic but i would be lying if i said it hadn't been a factor because around march and april time we were ready to launch dates and venues but because of the pandemic and the uncertainty you have contracts ready to be signed that can't be until we know exactly what's going on what i can say is the objective is very simple for the wdf the world championship as we knew it with the bdo is what the wdf are seeking to secure with prize money assured and a clear path to reach that championship the world masters we actually want to go bigger in terms of giving opportunities there are over 70 member countries in the wdf we want to give opportunities to all of those nations to reach the world masters so that wherever you play darts whether it be around the circuit whether it be in your own region or whether you're an amateur that gets to a qualifier and it's the best on the day we want to give opportunities for all of those types of players worldwide and the world masters will be an event that we look to modernize and improve on from the model that was before the way we've done the season is uh, january to december the, the bdo used to run october to september in terms of ranking the wdf were quite clear that it starts in january and it ends in december so the majors we look to place at the end of the year whether that be december or january and the only reason i can't give you a date is because it hasn't been finalized I'm not hiding anything. I just can't tell you anything until it's there. And anybody that knows me, Alex, I'm not going to tell stories. If if something's there, I'll tell you the truth. And if it's not there, I can't tell you. That's fair enough. And lastly, let's get on to Bullseye. This Saturday, ITV are going to be showing a a new episode as part of Alan Carr's epic game show. And you got the gig to be involved. I know to begin with, you were only told it was a darts TV show. But what was your reaction when you found out it was Bullseye? Well, you can imagine. I mean, it, it, it was like winning some kind of prize to be asked to do that. I, I was thrilled. And it and it actually came about around the time I was leaving the BDO. The two things weren't connected, but it was a real boost for me, yeah, a time in my career where I was having a lot of questions and not sure about the right thing to do. And then suddenly this offer of doing Bullseye, it is a one-off. I'd love to be saying, oh, we're doing the whole series, but the way the Alan Carr series has been done, it's a different game show every week. So hopefully this series is successful rolls again and we do another episode of Bullseye amongst that series it would be great wouldn't it but uh, to fill the great Tony Green's uh, shoes I, I never thought that was even possible I'm, I'm very chuffed as you can tell yeah and it's been a, a long time since it's recorded I think you recorded it around about this time last year I mean what can, yeah. da- what can darts fans and fans of Bullseye expect when they tune in on Saturday night well I think there's a combination of all the old elements that we love like we've seen with the previous episodes, if anyone's been following the series of the other game shows, they're longer. It's an hour long, so they've, you know, the format stretches to, to, to make sure that there's more games and there's more questions, more darts, and just more to be played across the, the whole episode. Uh, one thing that I was hoping for, and a lot of people are asking me, there isn't the bronze bully, which I was hoping would be part of the show, but we haven't got the professional player on it. So any darts fans listening now, it is not on it, so don't, so don't be disappointed on the night. I'll, I'll, dis, I'll disappoint you now. There isn't the professional player. There isn't the nine darts of, of 301. But as far as entertainment is concerned, it was such great fun. If it's as much fun coming across out of the cameras as it was to actually make it, people are going to absolutely love it. It was, it was so good. It really was. Well, I'm sure I speak for a lot of our UK listeners. They're all looking forward to, to watching it at the weekend. And Richard, it's always a, a pleasure to get you on the show. Really appreciate you taking out the time to chat with us and wish you all the best with how it goes on Saturday and, of course, all your work with the WDF going forward as well. 
Yeah, thanks, Alex. A nice to speak to you.